Joining us now, longtime top aide to Senator Bernie Sanders, Jeff Weaver. Um, thanks so much for being with us. Happy to do so. All right, so how did you meet Senator Sanders? You've been with him a long time. Yeah, a, 1986. A while. 1986. Oh yeah, that's a long time. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people watching I weren't even born in 1986. I was born. I was I, definitely born. Uh, I still love you a lot. <laughs> Uh, so I was, uh, uh, had been thrown out of uh, college at Boston University for anti-apartheid protesting uh, in uh, 86 and went back home to a small town in Vermont and was like, what am I going to do now? Uh, and there was this guy running for governor at the time, independent mayor of Burlington, Vermont, and I called down to his office. So one of his people came up and uh, should have been a warning sign, but within you know a couple hours, I was the county coordinator for a gubernatorial campaign. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you got promoted. I should, yeah, yeah, should have known better when that happened. But uh, I met Bernie not long after that at a, a, a dairy festival where I handed at buttons to him and held a sign, and uh -huh. we hit it off, and that's it. So what did you think of him when you first met him? Like, what was the first impression? Uh, he was a really uh, driven guy. Uh, he wasn't very well known at that time in Vermont, outside of Burlington. Uh, we were in a small town up in north of Burlington, uh, and he was, you know, he was so determined just to talk to people and articulate the issues that were of concern to him, uh, many of which are the same issues he talks about today. Yeah, well, that's a great segue for me. Um, we pulled a, a clip of Senator Sanders talking about the media. This is back, I think this was 1987 when he was mayor of Burlington going after some of the local media and criticizing corporate control. Let's take a listen. The first point to understand is if you think that the function of Channel 3 or the Burlington Free Press is to educate you about the world in which you're living, it's not. It really is not. And that's not, that's the nature of private media in general. The function of private media is to make money for the people who own the media. It is a business. When you go to McDonald's, you don't go there and say, Jesus, I didn't get the whole story about what's going on in Nicaragua. You got a hamburger. And when you watch television, you also should not be terribly disappointed that you have not learned about what's going on in the world in which you're living. That is not the function of television. I mean, it's incredible because he could literally be saying the same thing at a rally today and it would just sound like him today. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's been a lot more consolidation in the media since. Oh, that, yeah, that it's point. a much bigger problem now. Right, absolutely. And, you know, we, we see it, you know, in terms of the coverage. You know, uh, local news is uh, disappearing fast in this country. I mean, you know, we all know folks who, journalists who have been laid off because of these consoli you know, this consolidation. So, you know, it is a trend that was a problem then and it's worse now. We talked earlier about how you see him as being written off by the media before and in his first run for president, that there was a Bernie blackout and they're just, oh, that's cute that you're running. That's very nice. We're all going to move on to the Hillary Clinton coronation right, now. Right. Um, I mean, has that been a trend throughout his career? Has he been consistently sort of dismissed by the media? Does that have a long a history? Absolutely. He has always been underestimated. And, you know, he is uh, an incredibly, uh, and, and, you know, because you've met him, I mean, he is very, very focused, right? His work is his life. There is no, there is nothing else other than his kids and his grandkids. There is nothing else. There are no hobbies. There's no, you know, casually watching TV for entertainment. You know, he works 24/7. He works harder than anybody else with him, and he he has a mission, which is to help working people in marginalized communities, and that's what he's worked on his whole life. Where does that fire come from? Well, look, I think a lot of it comes from, and he's spoken about this some. I, I know people would like to, him to speak about it more, about his... It's, and it's not really his thing to talk about not, it's not. It's not his thing. He'd rather talk about you as opposed to him, right? And, But, you know, he, he comes from a, a, a very close-knit ethnic community. Uh, a lot of folks there who were numbers on their arms from the Holocaust. Uh, there were a lot of economic difficulties in his family. They weren't poor, but they were, you know, always struggling. Um, you know, his mother died young, and there was, you know, anxiety about health care. Uh, with her uh, illness. So all of these things, you know, he has internalized and, you know, he sees it reflected in other people's lives and he's trying to make it better. As his, you know, advisor, he's trying to help him win. Like, is that, I am trying to help him win, Is yes. that frustrating that he won't talk? Because no. people want to see that, like they want to see that emotion, they want to see that vulnerability. That's not frustrating to you? No, look, there's too many candidates out there who listen to people like me or, or uh, other people who are like, this is how you have to be, this is what the poll says you have yeah. to say and how you have to say it. And, 
you know, I mean, I think we saw some of that with Kamala Harris and the healthcare thing, right? First she was Medicare for all, and then I'm sure a consultant said, no, no, you can't be for that because if you take away people's private insurance, they don't like that, so you gotta be for this. And, you know, then you just look inauthentic because you're being inauthentic. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. So how do you see your role then? Because a lot of people in your position would see it as like, let me craft the words, let me, you know, make sure that they're showing enough vulnerability, doing the right, saying the right things, but Bernie says what he believes. Obviously, you know, we've got another clip we'll pay, play in a little bit. He's been saying pretty much the same things for a lot of years. So how does that change your role on the campaign? Well, you know, a campaign communicates with the voters in many ways. So one is him speaking, obviously. Yeah. Another way is for surrogates from the campaign to go on uh, media programs. There's also paid media and there's, uh, you know, press releases and a there's whole Cardi bunch of things. There's Cardi B. <laughs> but, you know, and different uh, groups of voters are interested or more interested in some issues than other issues, right? And so, you know, part of what I do and other people on a campaign do is uh, try to make sure that people who are concerned about issue A are hearing about what Bernie Sanders has to say about issue A, right? And, you know, that, there's a lot of science to it, a little bit of art, but, you know, that's what you do. Could you have ever imagined when you were, you know, it was 1986, 1987, and you're with him there in Burlington. How does that feeling compare with the feeling now and the experience now of campaigning with him? Sure, we were driving around in my Ford Pinto. I think I had a Ford Pinto at the time. Uh, driving <laughs> Quality around, car. Driving around, American, American made, <laughs> union made. We were uh, driving around Vermont. And, you know, we'd go to events with, you know, five, eight, 10 people, right? 25 people in the room, it was like a fantastic Overwhelming, showing, right? right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Now it's like, you look out and there's 30,000, you know, people, or you see these pictures of him in a stadium with just like, filled with people all around him, surrounding him. Uh, and he looks like very small in this giant sea of people. So it is a little bit surreal. Is it more, I mean, is it more thrilling than those early days or is it kind of the same emotional landscape? No, well, I, it's just very different. I, you know, yeah. I was young and I had never done politics and so yeah, I didn't so really know what to exciting, expect. Right? Yeah, right, exactly, everything's new. Yeah, I got a little bit of a tip that uh, you and, and the senator would, would stand out with signs and have a competition. We, we, we did a thing called Honkamania. We would stand <laughs> on a corner, and uh, as Bernie got uh, better known, you know, more people would see him, just like they do now, right? They'd mob him or honk. So we would stand on a corner, I would hold a sign, he would wave, and then we would try to get, first, at first we were just trying to get any reaction, right? A wave or whatever. So eventually we got enough that we would only count the honks. Like people honk their horn, not if a wave didn't count. You know, we got mooned sometimes. We got the bird. We got other things too. <laughs> mooned. <laughs> we got to get mooned one time. <laughs> so, the, and so what would happen is, is we would stand at a busy intersection, and there'd suddenly be this flurry of people honking, right? And it would get louder and louder and louder. And then Bernie would wave more and more furiously as they honked more, and then he would yell at some point. Honk a mania. <laughs> anyway, and, <this> was, <laughs> and we would keep track of how many honks we got in a certain amount of time, and we would try to beat our record. There you go. I mean, it's like a daily tracker. Passing the time, right? exactly, exactly. It's like a low budget daily yeah, exactly. tracker. Focus group. Um, I pulled another clip for us to take a listen to. This one, I think, is from 2003 when Senator Sanders was then Congressman Sanders, the one, you know, at large Congressman from. Vermont, and he is challenging then Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan. Let's take a listen. But today you reached a new low, I think, by suggesting that manufacturing in America doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where the product is produced. We lost two million manufacturing jobs in the last two years alone, 10 percent of our workforce. Walmart has replaced General Motors as the major employer in America paying people starvation wages rather than living wages, and all of that does not matter to you, doesn't matter. If it's produced in China, where workers are making 30 cents an hour, or produced in Vermont, where workers can make 20 bucks an hour, it doesn't matter. You have told the American people that you support a trade policy which is selling them out, only working for the CEOs who can take our plants to China, Mexico, and India. I mean, it's it's incredible to watch because it's very prophetic. And of course, now we're f only further yeah. down that road yeah. Yeah. of manufacturing job yes. loss, of automation, of globalization. So w what does the future look like? How do we, given that we're so far down this path, how does Senator Sanders see us 
being able to create good jobs, create union jobs, create a society where people have basic dignity, which is what this is all about. Sure, for sure. Well, a number of things. You know, he has a long, for a long time introduced legislation to make it easier for workers to unionize and to uh, require that uh, companies negotiate in good faith with those unions. Uh, so that's step number one, uh, because clearly we have seen a decline in the middle class has been sort of commensurate with the decline in union me union membership and, in this country. And can I just say, sure. I think that trend is one of the most significant trends in undergirding our economy, undergirding our politics that gets almost no coverage. Absolutely, 100% true. Uh, the other thing, look, the other thing we've got to do is, you know, Bernie voted against every one of these job killing trade deals and you know when you talk about Joe Biden this is one of the big differences between them uh, and why these working class voters ultimately are not going to go with Joe Biden because as his record on trade becomes you know receives more scrutiny uh, those voters will not be happy with what they uh, see but you know Bernie has voted against PNTR with China he voted against NAFTA you know now we're in a place uh, because of these trade deals where, you know, a lot of jobs have been shipped offshore. And the, qu the question is how we start rebuilding that manufacturing base uh, in this country. Now, you know, Trump has gone in there with a hand grenade, and acted recklessly and a lot of bluster, but not much else. Uh, but we do, we do need to have a, a president who's going to sit down with uh, foreign leaders and renegotiate these deals. Last question I have for sure. you. A, a, lot, a lot of the senator's record has been very consistent, right? You know, I played these old clips sounds the same then as he does now. What is the area that you think he has evolved and changed the most, either a political area or sort of personally? Yeah, I do. I, well, I mean, you mentioned earlier talking about himself. He does, despite the media narrative, he does talk about himself a lot more than he uh, used to. And, and there are particular moments uh, when he uh, you know, talks about himself more, I think, when he is sort of emotionally engaged uh, in, in a way that prompts him to talk about himself. So I do think that that is one way in which he has changed the most. Jeff Weaver, thank you so much. Great My to pleasure. see you, sir. Thanks. We'll have more rising after this.